Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your holy word, oh God. Father, your word says, oh God, Lord, that is living and, and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, I thank you that your word, oh God, is surgical, Lord God. And when there's surgery, Lord, there's bleeding that takes place, oh God. But then you heal, oh God. Father, we pray, God, that as your word goes forth, oh God, that you will cut us, oh God, deep, oh God, Lord, in areas, oh God, where we need that, oh God, surgery in our lives, oh God. Whether it be, oh God, anger, Lord, unforgiveness, oh God, lust, oh God, self centeredness Lord, we pray that your word will continue to have that penetrating effect in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. So Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 8 to 15, and I read, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen. But they cannot stand up against the wisdom of the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified this fellow Never stop speaking against this holy place and against the law. But we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So the theme of the message is Stephen, a great Christian example. But before we get into those points, the Bible gives us a sketch of Stephen's life. Stephen's life, basically from chapter 6 to chapter 7, just two chapters, Stephen's life, but it gives us a sketch of what type of man he was. I'm going to read these to you real quickly before we get into our other points and explain that passage. He was a man full of faith. Remember, in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So he was a man of faith. That's important because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everything you get from God has to do by faith. You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. How do you receive faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. You want your faith level to always be on a 10? Keep feeding yourself with the word of God, meditate upon it, chew on it, digest it, let it permeate your heart, and your faith level is always going to be high. So Christians that are always complaining, and they're struggling, and they're always saying God is not going to come through, and this and that, you know that they have not been meditating upon the word of God, because the word of God imparts faith into your soul. The word of God is faith food. How many like to eat three or four times a day, and even snack in between? Well, you got to make sure that you're eating every single day spiritually because you are a spirit being. You have a soul and you live in your body. Your spirit, all of us are spirit beings. We're made in the image of God. We have a soul. What does that mean? Mind, our will, and our emotion. And we live in a physical body. So right now, I'm not looking at you right now. That's the body where you live. You are inside that physical body, the real you, your personality, your will, your mind, your emotions, you inside that body. But when a person passes away, they leave the house where they live and they go to be with the Lord. If they're saved, if they're not saved, Satan is waiting there for them and says, you belong to me. And in their sin drags them into hell. It's a scary thing to die without, you know, Christ in your life. So they were full of faith. Number two, full of the Holy Spirit. Remember, these are the requirements to be to serve as, as giving food. Remember Acts chapter 6. They were complaining. So the requirements, they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? In the Bible, to be filled with the Holy Spirit means that your life is controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's simply all it means. Your life is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Paul puts it this way. Do not be drunk with wine or alcohol because this will ruin your life. Listen to the comparison. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the comparison? When a person is filled with alcohol or wine, all of a sudden they're doing things that they wouldn't normally do. 
They're controlled by that wine. They act a little different. Some guys get a little more bold and start talking to girls, you know, all these different things. Why? They do, it's not dumb. It's the alcohol that's making, they're being controlled by the alcohol. So Paul is saying, instead of you being controlled by alcohol, get filled with the Holy Spirit and let him control your life. And when the Holy Spirit controls your life, you would say things that you wouldn't normally say in a good way. And you're witnessing and you walk away and you'd be like, man, I didn't even know, you know I knew all these scriptures. You do things you wouldn't normally do. You end up ministering to different people and ministries. Like, why? Because when you're filled with the spirit, you'll do things you wouldn't do normally do and say things you wouldn't normally say. So he was filled with the spirit. Number the other point, he was full of grace. Chapter six, verse eight, we're going to cover that. He was, he was full of power. We're going to cover that. He was full of wisdom. Remember, that was one of the requirements. They got to be full of wisdom. The next thing that we see in his sketch, a man of great reputation or testimony. Remember, they had to have a good reputation with those outside the church, not inside the church. Everybody had a voucher to say, this is a man of God. We watched him with his wife. We watched him with the children. We see how he behaves. There's no phoniness. There's no duplicity. You know, he has a good reputation. A man of great works. We're going to see in verse 8, he does miracles. God uses them. A man, a great defender of the faith. The first deacon of the church. Remember, he was just used to serve tables. The first martyr of the church. And we'll see that, you know, the following time when we cover his sermon. So they were not going to cover his sermon. So he was, you know, the first deacon of the church. And he just served tables. That's all he was called to do. But he was filled with the spirit and had all these qualities. And God will always prepare his ministers by giving them insignificant tasks. Things that nobody wants to do to search your heart, to see where you're at. God always does that. Everybody will want to grab the mic and preach and have everybody see them. Isn't that amazing? What a great, powerful preacher or singer, whatever. But no one wants to do anything that nobody sees. But guess who sees it? So Stephen was just handing out food and taking care of the money and all that. But God said, this guy's so faithful, I'm going to use him even greater than that. So if you're not faithful in the little things, you're not going to be faithful in the big things. If you're not committed in little things, you're not going to be committed in big things. And a lot of people disqualify themselves. They have gift things, they're anointed of God and all that. But God says, let me give them something menial to see how they respond. Let me see their attitude. And when God sees their negative attitude, he says they're not ready. And sometimes he'll bench that person for 10, 15, 20 years. Not that they're not gifted, but they're not ready. God puts them in the shelf. When you're ready to be used by me, then when you change your attitude, then I'm going to be going to use it because you should be able to want to do anything, even if it seems meaningful, for the glory of God. Everything for the glory of God. So that's just his character sketch. So number one, Stephen, a man full of grace and power, doing great works for God. It says in verse eight, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace. So we're going to, grace means God's love, favor, gifts, and blessing. And he had the grace of God upon his life. And that's what enabled him to do miracles. Constantly the grace of God. And we need to pray that constantly upon our lives. Lord, it is by your grace. Everyone is here is because of the grace of God. No one is that good. I can't get to heaven and say, Lord, I did it. You know, I, I, I was the one that made things happen. Everything is by the grace of God. Paul the apostle says, I am what I am by the grace of God. So he was a man full of the grace of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God. In the, in the Greek, it says the divine influence upon the human heart. That's what grace means. Lord, I want to be filled with your divine influence upon my heart. And let me just give you some scriptures on the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7 says this. I was made a minister. This is Paul. No one can make somebody else a minister. Who made Paul a minister? I was made a minister. According to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. Paul did not choose to preach. He said that God made me preach. That was his calling upon my life. He couldn't hide it. First Timothy chapter one, verse 14, it says, he says this, the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Again, he recognizes it was the grace of God. And Paul was one that had the credentials to boast if he wanted to boast, right? A Pharisee circumcised the eighth day, 
grew up in the best theological seminary under the feet of Gamaliel, the best scholar at that time. He had a lot to boast, but he always points to the grace of God was poured upon me abundantly. And that's important for us to understand. Now, that does not mean grace for us to sin or a license to sin. Because some people say, you know, I'm saved by the grace of God and their whole lifestyle is contrary to the word of God. So it's not grace for us to sin and for us to trample under the grace of God. It's grace to live holy and pure before God, not grace to live a sinful lifestyle. Well, how do you know whether a person is born again or not? Simple. First John chapter three says this. Whoever is born of God does not continue to live in sin because God's seed remains in him and he cannot continue to live in sin. So if someone says I'm a Christian and they continue to live in sin, are they born again? No. That doesn't mean that they might not sin or fall, but they live in it. They plan it. They scheme it. They they what they're going to do. They're going to do this or that. That's living in sin. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, again, it says this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. Now look at what that grace does. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his own people, eager to do what is good. So the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. So if you meet a so-called Christian that says, look, you can't judge me. I'm saved by the grace of God. You got to bring these scriptures up to them because the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. And here you are indulging in worldly lust. Right? And, and the sinfulness. So that's not the grace of God. They have a, a twisted view of the grace of God. They distort the grace of God as a license to sin. So it also says he was full of grace and he was also full of power. Power of the Holy Spirit. Both grace and power are necessary before a person can serve God effectively. How many know that we have the power of the Holy Spirit? If we've been born again, there's power that lives inside of us, the energy of the Holy Spirit, so that you can overcome sin, Satan, and the world. There's power that God has given us. The Holy Spirit is the divine presence of God, the power of God, the, his might, the strength, the energy, the force of God, who lives and acts through the believer. The Holy Spirit is the one who influences the believer, controls the believer, produces in the believer, and affects the believer. The work of God, both within and through the believer, it is not man, but the Holy Spirit alone who has the power to save and mature and work miracles among men. It's always by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to think about this church. The early church did not have any programs, no Sunday school, no youth ministry, no singles ministry, no programs, but only the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that sufficient? Yeah. Not saying that all those other things are not necessary, but just think about that. The things that we think that we man, we gotta have this and all this program, and we gotta imp imp implement all these things. They didn't have anything. All they had is you know, women and men filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to have a gathering, a woman volunteers, have it in my house. They get together in their house, the spirit of God is moving, they're having communion in the house, they're witnessing. I'm gonna invite my neighbor, invite your neighbor. And all of a sudden, the church starts growing and growing and growing without a building. And that's why the church that has grown so much is the church in China. They're not allowed to have a physical church building. So they have to meet underground. And it's because of that, they've grown so much. Because when you tell people not to do something, they do the opposite. Here, we have the freedom to do it, so we don't do it. See the difference? There, they're forced. Because now, I'm meeting. They, they can't meet, I'm going to meet. It, it, it feeds their sinful nature and their rebellion, right? Somebody tells you how to do something, you want to do it immediately. So the church has grown in China. It's a network of churches all around and people's houses and all that. Tremendously, just like the book of Acts. And they interviewed, you know, one of the guys who's leading it. You know, I'm part of a Thursday uh, pastor's meeting international. And they interviewed him. You know, so what are we missing in the church in America? He says, well, there's too much professionalism and institutionalism and all that. 
We got to go back to the way of Christ and the apostles. Simple. People opening up their house and let's have church. But a lot of people are, are stuck on building. Building, building. And I always ask Mike this question. If there was no church building, most people wouldn't have a ministry. They won't know what to do with themselves. And they won't have a ministry. So a lot of times the building provides for them the ministry. A lot of pastors, if you strip them out and, and tell them, okay, now you got to start a church in your house. Let's see what happens. And if it's really call of God, will God bring people to their house? And absolutely. That's why in Africa, you can't get ordained from a seminary until you start a church. Because they want to know if God is with you or not. Then you get your certificate. Can't get you know, your degree and then figure out, hopefully, you know, somebody will give me an opportunity to give you a church. You, they got to go out there. You got to, let's see what happens. If God's with you or not. And if God is with you, this person's called. You know, powerful, powerful. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. You know? Those of us who've been fasting, you know, I could have prayed there for an hour or two. Wayne could have prayed for an hour or two. Cat could have prayed for an hour. Because you're just flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not you. It's the Spirit of God just flowing through you. But when you don't fast, sometimes it clogs up, you know, that, 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 that tunnel that the Holy Spirit flows through, that, that vessel. So fasting keeps your spirit open so that you can have that easy flow in the Spirit of God. So that's what the power of the Holy Spirit does. Jesus did not send them out and said, go out there and witness, and hopefully this, this will work. Hopefully people get saved. They went out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 33 says this, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. The power of the Holy Spirit is what we need restored in the church. First, in your own life, that is the power of God operating in your life. In other words, are you free from any controlling sin? Not from the sinful nature that will always be there, but are you free from any controlling sin? Can you stand before God with a clear conscience without any known sin that's bugging you? So the, the power of the Holy Spirit has to work in you first. People have to see that Jesus transforms by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if your life is not transformed, then you're offering something to somebody that you don't have yourself. You can't offer freedom unless the power of the Holy Spirit has set you free. So the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Ephesians 3, verse 16 and 17 says this. I pray, now there's Paul praying for the church of Ephesus. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Where? In your inner being. In your spirit. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Learn how to develop your spirit being. A lot of people spend a lot of time with their physical body and how they look and all that. And that's wonderful. You know, I, I like to go to the gym and work out, but I don't invest most of my time in that. It's in your spiritual being. Invest it. Feed your spirit. You'd rather be a thousand times bigger on the inside than on the outside. That your spirit is strong. That you have the scriptures embedded in your heart. So when the enemy tempts you, you're able to quote the scriptures and tell him, get behind me, Satan. You want to build yourself up so strong spiritually. But a lot of people feed their spirit one snack a week and then wonder, why am I struggling spiritually? Feed your spirit, your spirit being. You know, the body's going to perish. Feed your spirit so you can grow and mature. The second thing we see here about Stephen, a man who defended the faith, a man who defended the faith. It says opposition arose. Why opposition arose? Because when you're doing the will of God, you will be opposed. If there was an easy way for God and for ministry, we'll have tons of people sign up. Sign me up. There's no resistance, no opposition. I want to do it. But opposition arose. Why? Because he's preaching the pure gospel. Miracles are taking place. However, members of the synagogue of the freemen, now the freemen were descendants of Jewish slaves captured by Pompey in 63 BC and taken to Rome. They were later granted their freedom and form a Jewish community there. So these are, are Greek speaking Jews. So they formed their own synagogue, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the province of Cilicia and Asia. Now Paul was from Cilicia, so Paul might have been here arguing with Stephen. 
They began to argue with Stephen, but they cannot stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Now here, God is using Stephen to defend the faith. And you got to understand that when it talks about arguing, it's not talking about two people yelling at each other. That's more American culture and all that. When they're arguing with Stephen, an argument is you presenting logical reasons for what you believe. Not yelling back and forth. When two people are arguing, a couple, no one's getting through anyway. There's no reasoning and all that. That's why sometimes I, I talk to people that want to argue without an argument. Right? I disagree with you. But I don't know why, but I still disagree with you. Is that really rational? No, you got to have reasons why you disagree. So here, when they argue with Stephen, it's not just them yelling back and forth, you're wrong, and quoting each other names. They're giving reasons. This is not true. And Stephen's breaking it down, being led by the Holy Spirit, presenting his reason. And it says, they were not able to stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. But Jesus promised that. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. And most people worry about what? What to say and how to say it, which means they're not trusting in Christ. At that time, what time? You'll be given what to say. People want to be given what to say before they start witnessing. That's not how it works. At that time, when you're in the heat of the moment, Lord, I'm stuck. At that time, it says it will be giving you what to say. But it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. How many have said, I don't witness because I don't know what to say. Put yourself in that situation and God will give you what to say. You're not going to be home and he's going to give you what to say. And you're going to come to that person and says, look, this is what God told me to say. A lot of time, most of the time is at that moment when you're witnessing at that moment, the Holy Spirit flows through you. Luke chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. Again, reiterating the same thing. Jesus said this, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you would defend yourself or what you would say. What do most people do? Worry about if I get you know, ask a question I might not know and how am I going to defend myself and this and that. Do not worry about what to say. He says, verse 12, for the Holy Spirit, now he has this nuance, will teach you at that time what you should say. How many want to be taught by the Holy Spirit? He knows everything. He knows exactly what that person needs to hear. He knows exactly whether they don't believe in Christ because it's more intellectual or is it more emotional, which means they're angry at God because they lost a loved one. So it's not intellectual, it's more emotional. The Holy Spirit knows that. We don't know that. But that's why if you're controlled by the Holy Spirit, he'll show you what this person, what's their hindrance, why they're not believing. Again, Luke chapter 21, verse 14 and 15. Jesus keeps reiterating this. Why? Because this is a big problem with people, right? We put our faith in ourselves. When you say, I don't know what to say, you're right. But it's not you saying it, it's the Holy Spirit. Are we going to trust in the Lord? Or are we going to depend upon ourselves? Same thing happened with Moses. I'm going to send you, send my brother. I can't speak. I can't do this. Lord, I stutter, all these things. And God had to rebuke him and told him, look, I'm going to be with you. You're not going to do this alone, but if our eyes are on ourselves and our own insufficiencies and our own weaknesses and our own gifts, we will always disqualify ourselves. But if your eyes are on Christ and say, Lord, I don't know what to say, but your word says that at that time, you're going to give me the words to speak. You know what that requires? Faith, right? It's easy to preach from up here, but when you're out there, people asking questions, it requires faith. We want to live by faith. Not by sight. Luke uh, 21, 14, 15. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you would defend yourself. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Was that this happening with Stephen at this moment? Mm -hmm. They can stand against Stephen, but they cannot stand against the Holy Spirit who was in him and speaking through him. The Holy Spirit was supplying the answers, the thoughts, and the words to say. Beautiful. The Christian ministry has nothing to do with us. He prays through us. The Bible says we don't even know how to pray. No one is that good. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. For the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we don't know what to pray for. That clear. 
So when you tell me, Pastor, I don't know what to pray for. You're right in line. The Bible says you don't know what to pray for. He, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, but we don't know what to pray for as we should. But on the contrary, remember that word means on the contrary. You don't know what to pray for. But on the contrary, the Spirit himself makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. Because he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the Christians according to the will of God. Who makes intercession? The Holy Spirit. So if you say, I don't know how to pray, join the club. None of us know how to pray. Even the Holy Spirit has to come alongside of us and tell you, step back, let me pray through you, please. <laughs> because you keep praying for yourself and me, myself, and I. Let me give you something to pray for that is in the heart of the Father. You want to hit the target in prayer? Worship for 10, 15 minutes until the Spirit of God comes upon you so strong and then he'll lead you what to pray for. Because only prayers that are according to the word of God, he hears us. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence that we have in God. What's the confidence? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So if it's not according to his will, what's the opposite? He doesn't hear us. And we know that he hears us. We have the petition that we ask of him. So if you want to pray, it says that with confidence. Pray according to the will of God. That's why some people pray, they shake heaven because they know what they're praying for. God's going to answer. They believe God. They pray according to the will of God. But how this prayer sounds, Lord, I hope that you will save my aunt and please, Jesus, do something. And I hope you do this for me, please. And is that confidence? No, that's begging God. We got to pray with confidence according to the will of God. Lord, your word says that your will is that none should perish, but that all should come to knowledge of the truth. Lord, don't let my aunt die in her sin and end up in hell. Mm -hmm. Is that more biblical? Yeah. Is that something that God would want to answer? Absolutely. Pray according to the will of God. And like I was sharing, you know, with Kathy earlier, you know, what we work in you know, the word of faith movement, you know, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. That doesn't exist. You pray according to God's will, because if you start doing that, you're going to be very disappointed when God doesn't do things that you're just commanding him to do. I need you to provide $2,000 by Friday. <laughs> Listen to how audacious that sounds. Like it's, it's presumptuous. So you got to know the difference between faith and presumptuous. You don't command God what to do. He's sovereign over the universe. Before you got here, he was already ruling the whole universe. After we leave, he's still going to be ruling the universe. We come to that as a servant, as a child of God. Lord, your word says, always what your word says. That's why you need to read the word of God to know what his word says in, in any particular situation. And you pray like that, God will answer those prayers. Because anything according to his will, he hears us. So it wasn't Stephen. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through Stephen. Because we already read that Stephen was a man full of the Holy Spirit. And of wisdom. That was one of the requirements in order to hand out food and deal with money. Think about that. Now we just put anybody, any volunteer. Back then, you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You got to have a good reputation. People have to vouch for you and say, this person's good. And you have to have wisdom. The filling of the Holy Spirit. Because when you're dealing with people, you need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I have gone witnessing with people when I was in Bible college. That the guy threw a Bible at somebody because they didn't want to believe or they didn't want to listen. You know, like I have mental issues, but but that's the point. And I was sharing yesterday in the men's group that when you're witnessing, they're asking you questions and all that. You have the truth. You share with them out of the love of God. It's not to be arguing who's right and wrong. And that's why when people ask me a lot of questions about this or that, how about this? My response is let's deal with one issue at a time. And if we deal with one issue at a time, then we'll move up to the next one. And a nice, calm, gentle conversation. You don't argue yelling back and forth, and I'm right, and Jesus is Lord. You know what? You're going to end up in hell. Many Christians do that and get frustrated because sometimes non-believers have good answer, questions, but we have good answers as well. So you need to study and all that and allow the Holy Spirit to flow through you. But when you're witnessing, never let the unbeliever see you getting angry. You already killed your testimony. If you have the truth, why are you getting angry for? Mm -hmm. If you want to talk, we can talk. But again, one issue at a time, because those are all these different things. How about this? And why this is that? One issue at a time. If you're ready to have an intellectual conversation, we can do that. Let's sit down. Go. What's your question? 
And I've done it like that. But you got to discern too whether they just want to argue. And if they just want to argue, just move on because they're not receptive, they're resistant. Everybody you witness to, they're either receptive or resistant. If they're resistant, get away from me. I don't believe in the Bible. Don't chase after them. And what do you mean? And you know, you, you're an atheist. The devil got you bound. And you start insulting them like that, they're not going to be one for Christ. But I've seen it over and over and over again. These are Christians witnessing in the flesh, wanting to convert that person in their own strength. But if we realize that when we're witnessing, no one comes to the Father except the Father draws them. I can't convert anybody. I'll talk to them about Christ, but it's his job to convert them. Now, if they're right there, they want to receive Christ. I'm ready. We pray for them. You know, you connect them and all that. But, but you're getting frustrated that they don't receive Christ. And, you know, I'm not going to pray for them no more. They're already showing fleshly activity. So we see Stephen was used of God. Number three, he was falsely accused. A man falsely accused. And that would happen if you're living right with God and you're walking with God. You know, people will make up stuff when they can't defeat you with an intellectual argument. They start name calling. And saying this or that about you, right? You ever minister to somebody and then they, they, they resort to name calling and all that. Just because, you know, they can't hang with the Holy Spirit giving you the answer and all that. It says in verse 11, they secretly persuaded men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. Against Moses, because remember the Sanhedrin was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. And Sadducees were the predominant ones in the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish uh, court, the Supreme Court. Sanhedrin and, and uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. But Sadducees only believe in the first five books of Moses. So they bring in an argument. Look, he's talking about Moses. What are you guys going to do about it? And against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the Lord. They see Stephen, they grabbed him and brought him before the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Jewish uh, court. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place, which is the temple, against the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Remember, they honored Moses. They only believed in the first Five books. The Pharisees believe in the complete Old Testament. The Sadducees believe only the first five books. They follow Moses, the Supreme Court. Most of them were all Sadducees. So these guys know what they're doing. They're saying, look, Moses, he's attacking Moses and he's attacking the temple. Now, most likely, Stephen preached, you know, about Jesus saying, I'm going to destroy this temple and rebuild it in three days, meaning the temple of his body. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, you see all these stones? Not one of them will be left, all of them will be thrown down. And then they ask him, when will these things be? And he says, there'll be war, wars, uh, rumors of wars, a famine, this and that. And that all happened. The temple was destroyed. Herod's temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Romans destroyed the temple. The only thing left, if you see pictures of Israel, is that wall from the temple. That's the only thing that was left. But Jesus prophesied, not one stone will be left upon this. Everything will be thrown down. 70 AD. You can read that, you know, in, in our history books. And even Josephus, who's not a believer, a Christian historian, writes about when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. There was blood all over the place. Killed so many Jews. And from there on, they got scattered all over the world. And so they finally came back. I believe it's 19, uh, 1948. They came back. And Israel became a state. But they got scattered in 70 AD. So here, they must have heard him preach that Jesus, you know, you don't need the law of Moses to be saved and all that. Remember, they were also trying to mix the law of Moses. You could be saved, but you also need to be circumcised, follow the law of Moses. So they, start, they started making all these different things up. False accusations to try to get Stephen in trouble. And sometimes the enemy will do that. Will stir up trouble for you by other people. Now, sometimes with reason, Right. Like the person at work who's always taking excessive breaks and all that and claims that they're witnessing and this and that and they get in trouble, they get written up and then they come back to you and say, pray for me, the devil is persecuting me at work. Is the devil persecuting them at work? Or is it just their nonsense? Yeah, so that's not really the devil persecuting them. You know. So this is different. This is somebody that's speaking the truth and doing things right according to God's way. Persecution will arise because whenever we move forward, Satan will always oppose the truth. Always. Why do you think some of these churches that are compromising the truth and selling out a pack? Because devil brings people, you know, to sit there 
and enjoy the distorted word of God and end up dying and end up in hell. You don't mind that. You, you want religion? I'll give you religion, you know, forced and twisted, but you're going to end up in hell, you know, so that's the way he operates. So he was falsely accused. And number four, Stephen was a man of great communion, surrounded by the Lord's presence. Look at that verse 15. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face like the face of an angel. The word face of an angel refers to some splendor glow, shining radiance, some glory that was present. Apparently, God gave Stephen some special glory of himself that he had experienced but Moses had the same experience. We read Exodus chapter 34, verse 30 says this. When Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, shining, and they were afraid to come near him. Now remember, Moses fasted two times for 40 days without food or water. Now God must, must have supplied the water for him because a couple of days without water, you die. But it says without food or, or, or water up there, Face to face with God. Of course, he didn't see God's face. Anyone who sees God's face will die. But he said, Lord, show me your glory. God says, my glory is going to pass by you. And then turn around. And when you see me, you're going to see me from the back. And he says, I'm going to give you that privilege. And he did see the glory of God from the back. You know, but his face, being in that presence of God, came down, shined. Everybody was like, whoa, Moses. You're from another world. You've been spending time with the Lord. and the rest. Don't even talk to us. You talk to God and whatever God tells you. We'll listen, but we don't even want to deal with this God. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, repeats the same thing about Moses' face shining. The old way, the old covenant, with laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. So again, reiterating the same thing. Moses had the glow of God all over him. Because when you spend time with God, you become like God. Right? There's a saying that says, tell me who you hang out with, and I'll tell you who you are. If you hang out with God over and over and over again, stuff starts sticking to you. You become more patient. You become more loving. You start fellowship with him. You start loving everybody. You become more kind. You get closer to God. So that's what happened in Christ. But of course, Christ also had this experience in the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2 says this. As the men watch, Peter, James, and John, Jesus' appearance was transformed. So his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And at that moment, Peter, not knowing what to say, said this. Which tells us, if you don't know what to say, don't say anything, Peter. Right. The Bible actually says that not knowing what to say, Peter said, Lord, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Sometimes people feel like they have to speak. You know, I, I don't, That's why I always say some people have something to say, and then there's people that have to say something. <laughs> Which one are you? You know, so... Christ had that same spirit. So they're looking at Stephen. He's standing there in the middle, and they look at him, his face, like the face of an angel, the glory of God. And that comes by spending time with the Lord. Not that your face is going to be shining and glowing, but unbelievers sometimes will see something in you that's different. Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And then he goes on to say, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So we are the light of the world. And the more you spend time with Christ and, and prayer and in his word, and I pray that you will continue in his word after the 21-day fast, you develop that habit of reading the word over and over again and praying that you develop those habits during these 21 days that will carry you throughout your Christian life. But the more you read the word and you pray and you spend time with your heavenly father, you become like him. The image of God begins to be reflected through your life, that people know that you are different. You might dress the same, but you are different. You are from the kingdom of heaven. You come with different principles. You're part of God's uh, creation. You're part of God's church. And we have to uh, 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 exemplify that. Mm -hmm. As we walk and pray, they see that we're different. We're not of the world. Jesus told us that was this. If the world hates you, it's because you're not of the world. Just as they hated me because I'm not of the world. So a person that claims nobody likes me, they want the world to like them and all that, we're never going to be in the same page with the world. 
Our job is not to conform to the world. It's always to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in love and, and showing the mercy of God and the grace of God. But a church that starts conforming into the world, it's no longer a church. It becomes a social club where people go to hang out and meet their friends. But they're there in sin and not really seeking God. So I just wanted to conclude with that, with Stephen, a great example of what it is to be a Christian. Let me just repeat before Wayne comes up and leads us in communion. He was full of faith. Full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power, full of wisdom, a man of great reputation and a good testimony, a man of great works. God used him to do miracles, a great defender of the faith because he was controlled by the Holy Spirit. The first deacon of the church who was not, you know, complaining because he had to do a menial task and the first martyr of the church. And we'll get to that, you know, later on when chapter seven, he preaches one of the best sermons you ever read in the whole Bible. We'll take you through Genesis all the way to the end to Christ. Powerful sermon. And then he gets martyred. So the first martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ is Stephen. His ministry was short, but God used him and recorded what he did in the pages of scripture to encourage us. It doesn't matter how long our ministry is. It's more how effective it is, right? Why don't we stand? Wayne's going to come up now and just lead us in commune and take us back to the cross. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. First off, does everybody have a, a wafer and juice? If not, Kathy has it. She'll be passing it around. Amen. Amen. And if you're at home, you don't have one of these, grab a cracker, a piece of bread, a little bit of juice, a little bit of water, whatever you have. This will suffice. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. First Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, starting at verse 24, says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, which was the bread that they were passing around at the Last Supper. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. His body was wounded, as Isaiah 53, 5 says, it was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we have been healed. Amen. Let's snap that way for him in resemblance to the breaking of his body, amen, even though not one bone was broke, amen? Let's partake of that wafer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Verse 25 says, in the same manner, he also took up the cup after the supper, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, that blood, that precious blood that was shed for each and every one of us at the cross at Calvary. Ephesians 2.13 says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, far off, before you were saved, amen, amen have been brought near now by the blood of Jesus Christ, amen, that amen. precious blood that he shed for us. Amen. It brings us back into relationship with God. Amen. Sin that once separated us, now the blood of Jesus brings us back into relation with our Creator, the Heavenly Father. Amen. Let's partake of that juice together. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice. On the cross at Calvary, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Your word says that you gave yourself for us, Lord. That you may redeem, Lord, us from every lawless deed and purify for yourself, Lord, your own special people that is zealous for a good work, Father. We just thank you, Lord Jesus, as the author and finisher of our faith, Lord. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for laying down your life, my Lord, 
and taken and uh, upon your body, Lord, the most gruesome, horrific beating ever, Lord, that no natural man can sustain, Lord, or withstand, Father. We thank you, Lord, for going through that for us, Jesus, and shedding that precious blood, that blood that is so precious, that blood that is so powerful, Lord, that it wipes away the sin of the world. Lord, we thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that we can cons consistently, Lord, be drawn back to the cross, Lord, and forgiven, my Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we now, Lord, have an opportunity to enter, Lord, into eternity with you because of what was accomplished on the cross at Calvary. Lord, we just thank you, and I ask that you have your way, Lord, in each and every one of our lives, Lord. Bless each and every person here, my Lord. Bring to remembrance, my Lord, your, your, your scriptures, Father, that they have been deposited in their spirit, my Lord. Father, I pray for strength. I pray for encouragement. I pray, Lord, that the eyes of their understanding be open and enlightened, my Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Father, have your way, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's children said, amen, amen and amen. The altar is open if anyone needs uh, prayer. Amen.